Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. This is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have a very esteemed guest, Dr. Azra Raza. Um, she's the Chen Sun Chung Professor of Medicine and Director of the MDS Center at Columbia University. Uh, she's a practicing oncologist that sees uh, dozens of cancer patients weekly. She's been doing this for years and years and years. Um, she directs a basic cancer research lab with hundreds of original publications and high-profile journals. Uh, she has a book out called The First Cell on the Human Costs of Pursuing Cancer to the Last that came out October 2019. Uh, it's a good book. I've started in on it. It's uh, an emotional book, but a very good one. And her life is uh, devoted to early detection and prevention of cancer. So Dr. Raza, thank you for coming. It's an honor to be on with you, Richard. Well, um, I know you've had to tell the story in different facets many times, but how long have you been working with cancer patients and what got you into it? And, uh, you know, yeah, what started you out? That's a good place to start. I grew up in Pakistan, um, Richard, and in was very interested in um, just nature in general to begin with, very curious, uh, asking lots of questions all the time. And uh, when I was little, I would be following ants around, for example. And when I uh, a choice of career came along, there was no question in my mind that I wanted to study science, uh, and especially natural sciences. But the problem was that in Pakistan, we did not have advanced science degrees except through medicine. So that's why I did medicine. Uh, but once I was introduced to my first patient, that was about it. I knew that from that moment on, everything I do would be in service of, uh, in service of patients. Okay. And um, you've been working with cancer patients for how long? 30 years? 30 plus years now. So I came to this country wow. in 1977. From that point on, 1980s, that's all I've been doing. Oh, wow. Uh, well, you know, this is a part of the problem, but, you know, have you seen cancer treatment change much over the past 30 plus years? Dramatically change. For example, when I came uh, in 77, I was treating acute myeloid leukemia, the disease I began by studying and treating with two drugs called 7 and 3. Um, they're called 7 and 3 because 7 days of one and 3 days of another. And they, they were only 10% patients who uh, survived 5 years as a result of this treatment with the two drugs. That was in 77. Today, in 2020... On the one hand, we are still using the same two drugs, seven and three. But on the other hand, the survival is 50% in five years. Why? Because we learn to take better care of patients in terms of better antibiotics, better supportive care, anticipating problems, giving bone marrow transplants. So in some ways, it's dramatically different. In other ways, it's embarrassingly, shockingly primitive. It seems to me the understanding of cancer, the understanding we think we have is fundamentally flawed. Um, you know, from what I've learned in speaking to a lot of researchers that cancer is very heterogeneous. There's not just one cell. There's a many, many different kinds. And, you know, it's a living thing is what it appears to me. It has its own defense mechanisms. It has a tremendous set of abilities to adapt and change and hitting it with just one or two drugs. Um, especially in light of the fact that it doesn't really seem to help and it just emboldens it to come back more aggressively and worse. I mean, it doesn't seem to sink in. Uh, a different approach is needed, it seems like. Richard, what you are saying is not anything that comes as a surprise to anybody. We have all been saying the same thing forever. Since I landed in this country, this has been the conversation that cancer is heterogeneous, hmm. It's not one disease in the same patient at two time points or at two different sites. It's not the same disease. The question is, why can't we rise above all this then? And something that I'm very allergic to is that younger people come in waves. 
acting as if the last 60 years haven't existed. Do you know that uh, the, my book, The First Cell, was being discussed by a class of Yale students. And so last week, uh, the, their teacher asked me to join. Hmm. Okay. And I was asked a question, something like you asked just now, that cancer is so complicated and, you know, um, what's a better way of dealing with it than just slash, poison, burn, trying to hit it with everything we have and get rid of it in one way or another, cut it out or poison it or burn it. What else do you think? And so I started to tell them about how complex it's not just the cancer cell itself, it's genetics, it's microenvironment, the blood vessels that are supplying nutrition to it, the cytokine storm all around it, the immune cells trying to control it. It's so complicated. One of the students said to me, well, Dr. Raza, that may have been for you, but right now I'm working with a scientist and we understand that in order to successfully treat this disease, we have to take evolution into consideration. And so we are designing therapies that will attack uh, simultaneous waves of cells as they evolve. To this, my response was, I mean, the, the hubris involved in thinking that no one else has thought about this first. In mm -hmm. 1976, uh, Peter Noel wrote a classic paper, which has now become a classic paper, describing the clonal evolution in cancer cells and predicting exactly the conundrum we find ourselves in today. And we have painted out the corner with over and over that each time a cancer cell divides, it picks up new mutations. So it's giving birth to two new cancer cells potential and that there will be no way to deal with as this advanced kind of disease the simpler, the better. The earlier you get it, the better it is. There's no point in keeping, uh, keep hacking at the leaves. You have to go for the root, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is back in 1976. In 1977, one of the first papers I reviewed in the lab was this one, and it okay. laid out the entire story, which has only been confirmed word to word by all the fancy genomics and transcriptomics information. And I had to tell this young man that you can't act as if the past doesn't exist. I was, in fact, one of the first people who designed with my late husband the protocol, which was called time sequential therapy. This is exactly what we were doing, Richard. Can you believe it? Even the names, time sequential therapy. I was doing it in 1977, which this young man is lecturing me about now. <laughs> <laughs> so even giving cancer the... Well, I don't want to say the respect it deserves, but the uh, it's amazing its power. Do you think that there is any way, once it advances beyond a certain stage, that we can fight it? Or is that just because the battle's gone on for so long? Are we out of ideas? Is it really only catching it early that you think is going to be the, the thing that can stop it? Like, What's your overall thoughts? I think those are very good questions. My overall thoughts is just look at the field as it exists today. We are curing 68% of the cancer, and that's great. But what are we curing them with? Slash, poison, burn, surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, the same treatments we were using, save for a few rare exceptions. So I don't want to, people to think that I don't know about antibodies or immune checkpoint inhibitors or CAR T cells. Those are very rare exceptions. By and large, the common cancers are treated with the same traditional therapy. It is shocking that in this day and age of such advanced technology, we are using such paleolithic cavemen treatments. These yeah, treatments were given basically as stopgap measures. We are going to understand the biology of cancer and then try to undo the damage that has been done to the cell to convert it from normal in cell. And hundreds of thousands of researchers in the last 50, 60 years have worked very hard to do just that. And we have not succeeded. Why? Because it's a moving target. Mm. Sure, we are uh, curing 68%, but the reason for the fall in mortality by 1% a year in the last three decades is only because of early detection and reduction in smoking. So the oh. earlier you, so it's not just my, but the earlier the can detected, the easier it will be to, to treat. This is what his, history is showing us, that the only way we are making any headway 
is even the same very effective therapies that cure 68% fail entirely when the disease is advanced, the same disease. So if early detection seems to be the best way right now, while we work out the complexities of metastatic advanced disease, then why not go for proper early detection using all our resources? You know why I think part of the reason is that uh, when I ask people how does cancer start, there the story is just, we don't know, or, oh, uh, one cell randomly mutates and then it starts cancer. And I, I just don't think that that is how cancer starts. And I think if you view cancer as, if you view cells as machines and not living organisms that adapt and have some level of cognition, and, you know, if you view the beginning of cancer as just some random event, I think that's going to make it a lot harder to actually figure out how it starts. No, I, I mean, I can't argue with you whether it's a random ad- event or an adaptive event adapting to old age, for example. There are so many changes happening all around that cells that uh, because of age are poisoning the environment, making cells misbehave. You know, every morning I get up and look at the mirror and (laughs) it's shocking to see myself. But the thought that comes to me, to mind is, if this is what age is doing to me on the outside, imagine what it's doing inside. Mm. So you're right. It's a very simplistic way of thinking about uh, a cause of cancer or one cell going rogue or one mutation causing, you know, wreaking havoc on the system. It's all these things that are co-evolving simultaneously. And this is why cancer is so much more common with aging, that many things are going wrong. The immune system is becoming decrepit. The cells are collecting more and more mutations. Uh, The systems around in the microenvironment are not as efficient in removing damaged cells and garbage disposal as they were before. So the whole uh, microenvironment is becoming poisonous and only um, supports the growth of a cell which is uh, slightly got a growth advantage due to some mutation or another. I think you're absolutely right. It's a misplaced to think of it as one cause. Well, if, if, if you're saying early detection is going to be critical into making an, you know, progress in cancer, then we need to really focus a lot on how cancer starts, I would think. Otherwise, how are we going to know how to detect it early if we don't know the hallmarks of it when it first starts? I don't think you need to know how it starts. What you need to know is what are its footprints at Uh, in the earliest stages. That's what you need to know. You don't have to explain the footprints, why they came around or how they came around. You just have to detect them. But you're not going to be able to detect them if you keep studying mice or tissue culture cell lines. You'll only detect it if you study humans. But the story about the person who loses his keys and looking for them under the lamppost in the middle of the night, and somebody said, well, where did you lose them? He said, a mile away, but it's light here. So mm. <laughs> when I ask my colleagues, what's the point of spending hundreds of thousands of dollars studying these fancy, um, uh, looking at proteins in a mouse uh, plasma, using these proteomic uh, sophisticated techniques when they have nothing to do with humans? Their answer is, well, we don't have access to human tissue. So isn't that exactly like looking for car keys under the lamppost? Well, I agree. And this leads into something that you've done. Tell me about the, the collection that you've been building for years. What, you know, how did it start and what, what does it contain? I came here, Richard, in 1977 and started uh, studying and treating acute myeloid leukemia. But by 1984, it was very clear to me that in my lifetime, this disease will not be cured just by the technique uh, strategies we were using because it's so vicious, so malevolent, so rapidly changing in front of our eyes that it is impossible to keep up with it with just uh, uh, the bludgeoning hammer of chemotherapy. And so I realized that many of my patients were giving history of having low blood counts or months before 
they developed acute leukemia. In other words, there was a pre-leukemic syndrome of some sort that leads to acute leukemia. And being a young, uh, naive person, I thought, wow, we should just be treating, catching it at that stage and preventing it from... And so I turned my attention in 1984 to studying pre-leukemia and following these patients as they develop leukemia. And at this point, I said to myself, well, if I'm going to study this disease, I should save cells on my own. I started banking blood and marrow and plasma and serum and biopsies and buccal smears and germline controls on every patient I saw and just kept doing it. So today I have a tissue bank of 60,000 samples from thousands of patients whom I have followed serially in a longitudinal manner as their leukemia evolved from a benign pre-leukemic form to a more malignant stage. And do you know that in these 60,000 samples, Richard, not a single cell comes from another oncologist. I still do the bone marrow. You do them all yourself? Wow. I still do the bone marrows myself. They are all my patients. Every vial, every cc of blood or marrow has a story behind it. And that's why I am all the more responsible that patients underwent a lot of pain, but they trusted me. Dr. Raza, even if it doesn't help me, if you think it's going to help someone else, go ahead, take as much marrow. Imagine the grace and nobility of somebody who knows they are dying, but who are ready to help others. This is how I've collected their deposits. It costs a million dollars a year just to maintain all the freezers, but there are no grants available to do it. Do you know who supports me? My patients. They Uh, want to give me money. I tell them, don't give it to me. Give it to my tissue repository. And they happily open their wallets. And the fundraisers I have, our benefactors, our supporters, families, our friends step up to give money. If I can't raise that million dollars to support the repository, the university will be happily uh, throwing these samples down the sink because they don't have the money to support it. Well, what about, I mean, so studying it... uh... I would think that other scientists would love to study it. I mean, they don't have to go and collect it from patients. I mean, the IRB requirements should be uh, pretty much non-existent. I mean, what, everyone's saying they can't get you know human tissue and samples, so they have to deal with mice. Why wouldn't there be a line of people like thrilled to uh, to study it? Good question, Richard. It's not that we've not been studying it. I have, as you mentioned in my introduction, I have hundreds of papers. But all we can do as single scientists and my collaborators, Dana Farber to Yale to Health to Stanford, all over the country. I work with everybody and we use the tissues, but we can only ask very specific questions about a gene or a signaling pathway or a drug But in order to really understand the earliest footprints of cancer, what we need to do is now study thousands of these patients in a serial manner, employing the latest technology of genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, panomics, and not only study just in serum and plasma and bone marrow and biopsies, but also in Um, areas like uh, blood and sweat and tears and urine and stool all over we should be looking for using the latest technology looking for the biomarkers of these uh, and who and why 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 aren't we doing it because even to study just for example 200 patients thoroughly would cost about 10 million dollars so to study the whole tissue repository the way it should be studied would be a hundred million Who has a hundred million dollars? Sure, everyone wants to come and take the samples and study it for their pet project or one gene or one protein, but that doesn't help my patients. That helps them get a paper in Nature or New England Journal of Medicine and get the next grant. But how does it help my patients? Well, I mean, how would it help your patients? I mean, what studies are are not being done on it that need to be done? I mean, ideally, yes, we want to do everything you said, but what I mean, are you on that path at least, or is there no interest in that path? I mean, what what can you do with the tissues you have? So here's the issue. I can do everything with the tissues I have. I just need the resources. But no philanthropist has been convinced that they should give me the money. Then I thought, Richard, that look, 
who is at highest risk of cancer those are the people who find a cell right because they are at mm. high risk you know who the people are i don't want to scare your audience i don't want to scare anyone i don't want to be a naysayer but one in five new cancers appear in people who have already had cancers like my own husband harvey he had one cancer when he was 34 and he got a completely different type of cancer when he was 57 from which he died mm. there are 16 million survivors cancer survivors in this country right now even if a million of them just give me 10 dollars a month for one year i'll have 120 million dollars so that's one way of doing it i have to get my word out this is why i wrote the book that maybe somebody will understand um and start doing this or one philanthropist who is a billionaire can give support this project but um the third possibility is that one of the big farmers who are actually interested in developing these markers for commercial reasons would get interested and there is one good story that uh, just 3 weeks before we went into this crazy lockdown from covid yep. i delivered dna samples personally drove them myself because i was a nervous wreck about putting them in any kind of mail to terry town where the company regeneron is located and dna samples from thousands of patients for whole genome sequencing that they are going to perform free of charge for me put the data in the i cloud so that we can access it and then a find relationships of that whole genome information with a natural history of the disease response to treatments all kinds of other things and this is worth probably over 30 million dollars by itself but they are doing it because it's to their benefit also mm. and to my benefit so this is another way of doing it i'm trying my best to get the same thing done for proteomics and for transcriptomics because i don't see anyone coming in and giving me the resources to do it i can't tell you how many times i've written to the nih by the way to the director myself so many times over the years they have no interest at all why this is what shocks why because i mean you know the thing is that most of the decisions we make are not made because we want to make them that's what we want to do in fact most of us on colleges do things we detest doing but we have to do them because they have been defined by key opinion leaders who say that if somebody presents with pancreatic cancer then the first line of therapy is this the second line of therapy is this third line is this if i deviate from that then i'm opening myself to legal challenge why isn't the nih director interested in supporting this huge tissue repository and helping me study it they don't have 100 million dollars that's very simple our budget is very small how do they support it well, you know the if you made a uh, if you made a pareto of the first experiments well i know you're doing some already but the, you know the the most important experiments to do how much would that be and and what would they be for instance yes that's the way i'm trying to approach it all i need is a few million dollars to do say proteomics and if we find the footprints of proteins a signature of proteins that tells me that when the same person 10 years before they developed leukemia when they had pre leukemia this was how the protein expression changed over the last 10 years this is what my tissue repository is showing which means i can trace it back to an earlier stage that only needs a few million dollars and then that could get us started and that could get us going this is why I, i have written the book the first cell with uncompromising honesty and completely candid assessment of the field and i am criticizing myself also it's not like i have been collecting tissue so where's my answer why have i failed so badly also and the reason is reasons are multifarious i mean there's so many things that um constantly challenge us and one of them is always much. what about um you know well you've essentially spoken to you know us funders but have you approached other countries um are you able to do that are there other countries you think or multiple countries that may want to have a consortium to study it would that be easier yes i have approached in fact cancer research uk they're called cruck i invited the head of cruk the head of the branch that is uh, 
a de dedicated to early detection of cancer who came to Columbia University, gave a brilliant seminar and we discussed and they said, yes, they're going to put out a request for proposals for $20 million. We can apply for it. And we were, we are going to apply as soon as they put that request out. And it will be a collaborative project with some scientists in UK, myself and some scientists in Seattle. And those are the kinds of things we are constantly applying for, Richard. And I'm very hopeful that the coming decade, I we will be able to make a difference. So don't let me uh, <laughs> give you only the good gloom and doom scenario as if it's all completely hopeless and it's helping. I mean, there are a lot of people like my patients help keep up the tissue repository the same way. I'm always able to raise some money to continue going. And as we find more and more technologically advanced uh, application of tests to detect the earliest footprints of leukemia, I think that we'll get enough excitement to follow it big time and then get the whole tissue repository studied. But the way I'm, I'll end by saying the way the system has evolved in this country is that let's say I as an individual scientist can apply for grants to the National Cancer Institute. Let's say I get the grant for five years. It's $250,000 a year for five years. With that, I can find one target and say, oh, I found a target. I think drugs can attack this target and will cure cancer. But to do the clinical trial to bring this drug to the bedside will now require $150 million even for the phase one trial. Where does that money come from? At this point, they turn it over to industry. Industry's only stated purpose is to make money. So they'll take it and they'll uh, try to uh, run with it and make uh, money for their shareholders. Just today, I got uh, an announcement from ASCO saying, I won't name names, but saying that a drug has been approved for ovarian and uh, cancer of some sort, in which, look at the insanity of this. The drug is approved because it improves by five months against the placebo, improves progression-free survival, not survival. <laughs> Can you imagine that we have come to the level where we are not, we've given up on improving survival in patients. As long as you don't see the tumor, that's considered a response because the tumor is microscopic. It will kill in the exact same time as it would without the drug. Hmm. But because there's progression-free survival, why, is, why are our agencies who are supposed to protect patients, why are they allowing this to happen? Now the company will make easily a billion dollars a year. And this is why 40% of women, 50% of women with stage four cancer today, with stage four breast cancer today are being hounded by collection agencies because we'll have to give them this drug and they'll have to pay whether they respond or not. And their survival won't be affected, but progression-free survival will be affected. It's why is this Wait, so happening? So Ezra, it seems like, uh, okay, so I mean, even if your tissue bank is studied, if the thought process and the studying is wrongheaded, which it sounds like it is, it's not going to help anyway. So it sounds like there needs to be a fundamental rethink of cancer itself. I mean, do you, what insights do you have from dealing with it for so long, from looking at all the studies? Like, you must have some, I don't know, I, you know, I'm not. I don't mean to put you on a spot, but have you thought that this just needs a complete paradigm shift and in, in how to, to deal with it? Richard, that's exactly what I'm demanding, a complete overall and a complete paradigm shift. But in order to do that paradigm shift, we have to show a better way. So what am I, what is my read on it? My read is that if we keep following the same old, same old, we are not going to get anywhere. We'll keep making the kind of differences that this progression-free survival study made, very small incremental changes that will take a thousand years to cure cancer. We don't have that kind of time. So the only strategy that works is if we catch it early. Even with all the current technology, we are catching only 68% of the cancers early, but we are curing them. First of all, we shouldn't be curing them with those horrible treatments. We should improve on that also, but we can only improve if we detect them even at an earlier stage. So my answer is that the best way to cure cancer is to prevent it from even becoming a bona fide, well-established cancer in the first place. 
how do we get there we have to study every secretion every compartment possible using all the technology possible that's all that will have to be done one way or another and i think people are waking up to it and they are putting more and more resources currently only 5% of the funding goes to early detection 95% goes to developing drugs like this one we talked about that is improving only progression free survival or doing mice studies and things like that but if we have current cancer patients we can't give up on them so of course we have to keep doing trials and keep finding but we can save a lot of money by if we stop doing me too trials that is 3000 trials checking for the same immune therapy against the same target but they are all competing because whoever makes it will be making a billion dollars a year so we can save all that me too me too money bring it to early detection my answer is the complete change is in strategies instead of trying to kill every last cell let's detect the first cell the exact opposite and try to even find footprints of the first cell and then it will be much easier to handle because the same targeted therapies and immune therapies that are costing so much causing so much toxicities will be far more effective the earlier we use them that's it okay i see what you mean so some of the therapies you think they'll be against a less formidable foe and that's why you know we we are on the track to find the right therapies but we're applying them at a too late stage is that that's what it seems to be what you're saying of course i mean i just said it several times in the beginning that the same chemotherapy which is curing 68% patients is failing 32% why just because it was more advanced you see what i'm saying Okay, it just took me a little while yeah. to get my head around it. Okay. <laughs> no, uh, I mean that, yes, earlier and earlier is the only way we have found anything historical. You, know you, know, you know why I ask? Because I hear a lot, oh, early detection, early detection, but no one defines why that's better or what that means. You know, that's, that's the problem. I've heard that a lot. You know, you have to catch it early. And, but again, I, I just haven't heard an explanation of why that makes it better. this is why because it's less complicated each time a cell will divide it will become more complicated and more adapted as you said brilliantly to its environment because that's the only one that will survive one that is uh, showing its fitness to the landscape so more and more uh, complicated cancers emerge which can um, be uh, resistant to all kinds of treatments but if caught early enough they are more vulnerable and this is what has been shown over and over you know in 1908 dr childi said it's not cancer that kills it's the delay in treatment that kills what's the um the earliest cancer that's ever been observed or earliest set of cancers like what is what do they look like how do they look differently than than later ones you know the kind of thing i'm going for no one has any idea because what i am saying is that let's say and this this is all happening this is all being studied let's say it, we will i will go to sleep in sh- bed sheets that will scan me overnight for the appearance of a hot spot in my body anywhere what does that mean well as soon as cancer begins it start it has to feed itself uh, because the cells are dividing more rapidly so it starts attracting more and more blood vessels to it so the area becomes hot starts forming new blood vessels and that can be picked up easily and so let's say that a bed sheet detects that there is a hot spot in the head of my pancreas one night that doesn't mean i wake up in the morning and should have an open abdominal surgery and evisceration of all my organs all it means is that there is an area of a region of interest in the head of pancreas now it should be followed more carefully with all the imaging scanning we have artificial intelligence we should be using that to hone in and direct direct our attention to that particular area but then try to supplement it with 20 other tests try to look for what does a common pancreatic cancer shed as proteins in the urine in the serum in the plasma in saliva in the breath what are these proteins that we can catch so we should not depend on a psa or a colonoscopy we should be having 20 tests to supplement that one finding and once over a period of a month or two months we realize that that hot spot has stayed is growing is getting hotter 
And now we are able to detect these proteins even in the urine and serum and saliva, then we know that whether it's really potentially lethal for the individual or not. Should we go after it or not? And if we have to go after it, then it's a tiny little blip right now in the pancreas. We can probably just use a well-directed super laser beam to just zap it out of existence instead of trying to give radiation therapy for uh, two months. So when you ask me what does the earliest can, we don't know because we have never looked for the footprints. Only artificial intelligence will be able to tell us whether there is really a region of interest because the human eye won't be able to see it even. Yeah. Hmm. But we can do all this. We should be able to do and we will be able to do it in the next 10 years. Mark my words, next decade will be, we'll see a complete shift in medicine from treating diseases to preventing diseases just like cardiovascular people did. Look, the mortality from heart disease is down 70%. Why? Because they learned not only to fix things early by open bypass surgeries or by stenting coronary arteries, but they started using statins to lower cholesterol to prevent. The same thing happened with Um, In 1940s, antibiotics were discovered that have doubled human lifespan. Nothing can be more dramatic in medicine than discovery of antibiotics. But the real, real, real revolution came when we invented vaccines and prevented all these diseases. Today, we are faced with a pandemic with COVID. I'm 100% sure we'll have an answer very quickly for it. We will overcome it. It's a pathogen. Uh, That's not the issue. We will overcome it, but the, but the important thing will be how to prevent the next one, right? That's what we have to work towards. And that's what I'm talking about. With cancer, we should be able to anticipate, find early, prevent it from becoming this. And then until and unless treatments alone will not be the answer for cancer, it has to be combined with prevention. And prevention, not just by lifestyle changes. Okay, I'll give up smoking. No, prevention by proactive screening, monitoring, and detecting abnormality. Hmm. What's um? Yeah, I'm not trying. To, I'm not trying to be snide here. But what about the uh, the microbiome? Uh, you know, it's the new. It's not really new, but it's seems to be new and not very well considered. Do you think that's going to be a very important part of understanding cancer? I mean, the reason why I ask is that I. I interviewed um, a lady named Florencia McAllister, and she was studying pancreatic tumors. And she said that the uh, the tumors themselves had a, a localized environment, that it was a different microbiome than the rest of the pancreas. So perhaps that will be a very uh, important thing is to look at the microbiome of you know the affected organs or tissues as well. Yes, I know this work very well. And absolutely, those are the things we need to study instead of studying Mice, we should be studying microbiomes in humans and trying to determine how that signature changes as cancer de- develops or evolves. I think all of this works in It is the right thing, yes. And you were not uh, being snide. You're being very brilliant by asking this question and very knowledgeable. Um, in regards to your tissue repository, are you still trying to grow it? Because, you know, one thing I thought is that the more you grow it, the more stuff there is to analyze. But the more you grow it, the more expensive it is to, to keep it. And, you know, I, I don't know. What if, uh, I know it was dearly acquired. I understand that, you know, from patients and everything. But I don't know. If you were to section it off into smaller units and sell off some of the tissues if you even could or make them available and kept a subset, would that somehow make it cheap enough where uh, you could do work, more work on it and still get results? I mean, I suppose you could do it, but I wouldn't want to because so many of the patients are alive and I've been saving samples on them for years already. And uh, one of them, for example, who's part of the book, uh, has been uh, contributing samples for 25 years. So uh, shutting this down would mean a third of the patients who are alive and actively giving. That kind of thing doesn't work. I mean, and why would I want to do it also? Think of this country's affluence. It can come up with a trillion dollars overnight because of a virus. But it can't come up uh, under normal conditions with a few hundred million dollars to study this, uh, these sample kind of insanities. 
I felt I like no one knows about it. And so I should do more and more to promote and to clarify the situation. And that was one of the reasons to write the book. Mm-hmm. But you see, what I did, Richard, is that what I do on a daily basis, I did exactly that. On a daily basis, I'm seeing patients. And mm-hmm. it is their stories that are the motivation for me. The good stories are the helium for my spirits. And the tragic stories, like my own husband's story, or the young boy, Andrew, or the 38-year-old Umar, or the 34-year-old JC, these are people whose tragic, not just uh, loss of life in the prime of their existence, but also the painful suffering that they went. And so I'm not telling these uh, cancer facts as if they are in different cold, hard subjects, but I'm looking at everything through the prism of human anguish, because Uh, this is what I deal with on a daily basis. And to separate human suffering and pain from the need to find the answers is, is criminal, because the motivation has to be for all of us is to try and reduce human suffering. And that's what we have. And that's what I think will motivate people to support the report. Well, very good. Azra, what's the best way for people to find out more and to donate and to, uh, you know, learn more about what you're doing? I think uh, I would be so grateful if people check it out on my website, azraraza.com or the First Cell Center, which is at Columbia University and support. Uh, the project and promote it amongst others because as I said it doesn't require that many people just cancer survivors if they step up and give just ten dollars a month and then yeah. it builds up like that okay well Ezra thank you for coming on the podcast and I'm, I'm glad I spoke with you and I, I appreciate uh, all that you do well thank you for having me and can I end with a short poem that I read to one of my patients when she was feeling very sick one day Sure, yeah. Because it's exactly what uh, we are going through today as uh, not just a country, but globally. This condition of life is not for the whole year. Only the few months when it rains. The blazing fire of the dry wood will cook rice in no time. And whatever is there will come back into view sharp and clear. When the rains depart... We will put out in the sun everything that is wet, wood chips and all, put out in the sun we shall, even our hearts. Thank you. Thank you, Azra. Thank you. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.